So let's look a little bit at minimalism and then briefly at <coughs> post-minimalist art. That's not a term you'll come across much in art history <coughs> textbooks, but I just want to look at certain works of art that are somehow in the, in the grain, in the trend of minimalism of a more recent time. Minimalism itself it belongs really to the 1960s, especially the second half of the 1960s, and then you know those artists continued working in later periods. Actually, it's a term first used by a philosopher, philosopher uh, Richard Volheim, in 1965. Although a lot of the art he was talking about isn't really art that we come to think of as uh, minimalist art. And some other terms were popular at the time, like people talked about ABC art or literalism or primary structures, but minimalism is just a term that has come to be, you know, to stick. But one shouldn't read too much into it as with many style labels, you know, and different artists that have been called minimalist, as with the different artists that have been called pop, may have different motivations. Minimalism is one of the main kind of moments of break, breakdown with a kind of formalist modernism. Uh, we can see how pop art was such a break, you know, going back to the world of legible mass reproduced imagery away from formalist purity. Uh, we saw some of the later abstract artists themselves also kind of uh, find a way beyond formalism, produce a kind of post-modern abstraction. Minimalism is, is one of these breaks. So one kind of common property with a lot of minimalist art is a concern with the phenomenology of perception, the moment or the time of viewing. And that in itself breaks down the notion of formal purity, that one needs time to take in a work of art. Carl Andre, one of the you know, prominent figures in minimalism, he put it this way, he says, the photograph is a lie. Art is a direct experience with something in the world, and photography is just a rumor, a kind of pornography of art. You know, there actually is something to bear in mind since we're studying through images in a classroom or with art history books of different kinds. You know, we're dealing with art inevitably largely at second hand through looking at photographs of it. Uh, so, you know, we are not having that direct engagement with art, except where, luckily, you, you are able to, to see it um, in a gallery setting directly. That really matters for minimal art more than almost any other kind of art. As well as minimalist artists having this concern for the process of viewing, they also tend to have a concern with the context, the space of exhibition as a whole. So you could say this is part of the beginnings of a concern with site specificity of art. And despite being at least in part a kind of critique of formalist purity, there are also some sense in which there are links to the pure abstraction of uh, you know, formalist abstraction. One example would be Carl Andre, we'll, we'll look at him in a minute. He was quite a close friend of Frank Stella. So at a certain point at the beginning of their career, late 1950s, early 1960s, their work is a little bit similar, but then it goes off in different, different directions. It shares with a lot of abstract expressionists and later American painting, the concern with a single unified image, a whole without parts, you often get that kind of feeling with, um, with, with minimalist art. Well, sometimes you also see modular elements, that'll be something that will come up as well. Um, 
keeping parts that are not of interest in, in themselves as parts. Repetition, additive st strategies rather than compositional strategies, ordering. Often minimalist art we'll see is using geometric forms, very simple geometric forms, often inexpressive surfaces. It's a very cool aesthetic, a very, in that sense, reactive against the, the gesturalism or the emotivism of abstract expressionism. And part of that uh, coolness comes from the fact that a lot of the art is not made by the artists themselves. It's fabricated by others to the artist's instructions. There's, a little bit some overlap with conceptual art in that way, a distance between the idea and the art making, but um, there are differences too. Often minimalist artists are very concerned with the materials, not just with the idea, the visual experience, not just the idea. So one aspect of having your work fabricated by artisans, or technicians, is to move beyond skill and virtuosity. It's very, often the surfaces are very austere, they're not sort of modulated. You're not concerned with how it was made so much as the context, it's the context of viewing that is the important thing, not the context of making. You, if you look at a Jackson Pollock painting, you can sort of follow how the, those skeins of paint were were made one after the other. You can kind of revisit the making, the moment of making of the art. But with minimalist art, that tends to be not the case. You, you, you tend to be concerned with the moment of viewing that you are in rather than the moment of making. And minimalism, another defining characteristic, there tends to be zero subject matter in the normal sense. It's, it's, it's a a kind of abstract art, you could say. It's, a, it's some very specific trend within abstract art. It's uh, pretty much uh, about sculpture, about 3D art. We'll see that there are some painters you can map onto the story of minimalism, but primarily it's, it's 3D. Although a lot of minimalism, it doesn't really relate to earlier sculptural traditions. You could say that minimalism comes about as a response to certain problems in painting. Painting got so, so simplified, so purified, maybe for formalistic reasons. Uh, you started to see monochrome painting. Suddenly there was so little going on within the painting itself that you started to look at the painting itself as an object. The interest was not was what was within the painting, but the relationship with the painting as an object with its environment. So suddenly you're moving into three, three dimensions. There's some parallels in other art forms to minimalist art. There's Sometimes people talk about certain music as being minimalist, like the music of Steve Reich and Philip Glass, where there's a lot of repetition going on. It's similar in some ways, perhaps, but um, I don't know. Some kind of writing, like the writing of the French novelist Rob Guillet, or some kind of dance sometimes is referred as to as, as minimalist. Often okay. Well what can you tell us something about it? Because that's not something I know that much about. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean that his style of writing is quite, um, I would say, minimalized. Hmm. He cut off like the very travel uh, descriptions or whatever. He focuses. He focuses mainly on like very uh, minimalized plot as well as uh, discourses mm. and he's often deemed as uh, a minimalist writer. Okay. 
I don't know if this is, has anything to yeah. do with the movement. Yeah. I think maybe a little bit, but uh, from the sound of it, but um, I think that there's there is always difficulties comparing from one art form to another. Even if you, even if say in music they use words like color or tone sometimes, but uh, it may mean something different or rhythm, but it may actually mean something different from what it means in a visual context. I think you can only go so far with those parallels but you know at least it, those tendencies did really occur in the same time frame so I think you, it's worthwhile to be looking at what connections might be there but not to be too sure that, uh, that, that, that they're, they're very meaningful deep connections. The, the connection with minimal dance is quite a strong one like the, the minimalist artist Robert Morris both his first and second wife were dancers uh, so there's some kind of and he himself gets involved with with, with, with dance a little bit so that there, there are kind of connections at the level of personnel apart from anything else I think it'd be hard with literature to have an equivalent to the kind of abstractness of minimalist art you know it's, 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 it's going to be different in certain ways the other thing I would say about minimalist art, that almost all of those artists are male. Um, that's not 100% true, but most of them were. So when we come to the post-minimalist period, maybe that's when things open up a little bit and you see interventions within, with min minimalists by, by female artists and, and non-white non artists, non-Western artists. Uh, exploring the possibilities a little bit. Okay, maybe that's enough uh, introduction. So, looking at it artist by artist, I'm going to start with Carl Andre. A lot of his very early works are just, you know, simple um, carvings of. Uh, into a single block of wood like this where you, you still have the sense of the original block that it was taken up so it's like construction grade timber and then he's used an electric saw to, to cut into it in a very regular way regular repeated pattern so it's like a kind of abstract sculpture but very very simple and it just sits there on the ground. Um, that kind of absence of base, uh, which is so often there with sculpture, is um, one characteristic of minimalism. There is no kind of mediation between the sculptural object and its environment. It directly relates to that environment. The base has already become problematic in modern art anyway. And you do get some uh, examples of modern art that, where the sculpture j just sits directly on the ground with no base. But uh, with minimalism, that's taken one step further. So yeah, just quickly looking at some of the early examples of his work from the late 1950s. This is the last ladder. Again, it's the sort of repeated forms, hollowing out of a, of a form repetition but it's still carving you know so it's sort of carving and modeling are the two main traditions that sculptors work in and this is very much in the carving tradition but very soon he gives that all up this is also kind of early example pyre 1960 well it's actually remade in 1971 here there isn't any carving of the elements involved at all he's just assembling them into uh, some, some kind of pile. Actually a little bit similar to something that was done much earlier by the Russian artist Rodchenko, Russian constructivist artist. This is Rodchenko's construction of distance from 1920. Actually Russian constructivism was not very well known in the West not that strongly influential in earlier moments of um, you know, Western European art history. 
because of the Soviet era that suppressed all this kind of art and the fact that so much of it had not traveled to be collected by Western collections. So if you went to look at the Museum of Modern Art or something, you probably wouldn't see much constructivism. There's just one or two constructivist artists whose, whose work was known in the West because they left as emigres, that is Garbo and Pevsner. They were very well known. They often stood in for what constructivism was. But Rodchenko, who is probably much more important in a way, uh, was much less well known. So it's a f relatively unusual source. If you go to the Stiedlich Museum in Amsterdam, that's one of the few European museums where Western European museums where you, you see a fairly large amount of constructivist art compared to elsewhere, compared to the Tate or MoMA, anyway. Another source that maybe he's drawing upon is Noguchi, a uh, Japanese-American artist. Uh, I know he admires Noguchi's work. Um, and this is M Noguchi's Humpty Dumpty. What, the, what it shares with uh, the work of, of Andre is that, that not using any kind of permanent connection between the objects. There's no gluing, there's no nailing, there's no other way of kind of, there's no welding. So with Humpty Dumpty, which is uh, a work from 1946 by Noguchi, um, you have that sense of fragility. Do, do you know the story of Humpty Dumpty? It's like a children's rhyme. Uh, he, he falls and can't be put back together again. Uh, so yeah, yeah, this is a very fragile kind of object, and then that's part of its aesthetic kind of properties. Um, I, I when I was a grad student, I wrote him a letter, uh, Carl Andre. I got a uh, reply. Uh, so one of the things he mentioned was uh, about Noguchi. I'm just trying to find it. Oh, that my works have for many years been joined, did not derive from Japanese art, but certainly was reinforced by it. Uh, I have admired the work of Noguchi especially for his precarious balancing of Eastern and Western influences. The balance does not always succeed, but neither are all my works worthy of comparison with his. So there's a kind of little... I, often artists don't like admitting influences, but there he, he, he's happy to do so. Sorry, someone had their hand up. Yeah. recently read something about how the Humpty Dumpty tale never ever mentions him as an egg, but for some <laughs> reason in all visual depictions, Humpty Dumpty is an egg. Like, the entire story never once does it even hint that he's an egg. I just thought that was hilarious. So like, this could very well be Humpty Dumpty. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't like an egg, but it's interesting to me. Sorry, yes. Right. Well, um, you know that's that's the problem of uh, visual illustration. You know, in visual illustrations, he's an egg, right? Mm -hmm. But um, it's like the problem with illustrating the Bible. You have to decide what eye color Jesus had, and things like that, because you've got to. If you're the painter, you better make up your mind. You know, but uh, you, your your written source won't tell you all the details. You always have to have an excess of information over, over the narrative. Another possible source is Brancusi, well, most famous carver in 20th century sculpture, of course, so it's, a, it's not an obscure source at all. But that interest in repetition of form, very minimal reductive form, but then repeating the same mo motif. That's a little bit bit like what Andre is doing. This is the Infinity Column, 1938. So one of the works he did back in his native Romania. Uh, I'll just 
interesting whether he mention, <laughs> mentions Brancusi in his letter, but I can't. No, he doesn't mention it, but anyway, I, I think it's very clearly documented that that is in one of his interests. And Brancusi's interest in the materials themselves uh, comes through, I think, in, you know, because there's so little forming of the materials going on, then you're very much aware of the, the actual properties of the, the, the specific pieces of wood. You know, when you're looking at a, a bronze a figure, a, a bronze figure or a marble figure, often you're not thinking of the marbleness or the bronzeness of it. You're just thinking of the figure. You don't think how strange to represent skin by marble. You know, you're just thinking of the skin. Cedar piece. 1964. Again, it, it's um, it's just a kind of sort of interlocking of forms. He he's talking about his interest in Japanese joinery, you know, famously Japanese um, joiners don't don't use glue and nails, so the, that's kind of s some kind of influence for him. In the 1950s and early 1960s, this is again in his letter, I was greatly moved by photographs of the carpentry of Japanese temples and classic houses and by the raking and planting of stones in Japanese gardens. It is doubtless that my first intuitions of place derive from those photographs and from an experience of the landscape of southern England in 1954. He had some relatives who were in English uh, I think he must have made a trip at that time to visit them. And what interested him particularly was Stonehenge, you know, very simple monolithic forms in simple kind of uh, arrangements. Yeah, he talks about that. So these kind of works relate to the, those kind of monolithic early structures. Lever. 1966. Just a series of, you know, commercially manufactured bricks. You can see, you can see the kind of stamp on the ed edge of the brick arranged in a row across a space. Such a simple form, therefore you stop being concerned with the, the form itself and concern how that form changes the environment in which it is. It, it becomes site specific, it becomes about the environment, not so much about the form itself. Sculpture is uh, almost always vertical, you know, because it's almost always about the human figure. Compared to painting, painting, you know, even pre-modern painting could be a it could be a landscape, it could be a portrait, it could be a still life. Sculpture is rarely anything other than a human figure or a group of human figures, and human figures usually are standing occasionally sitting, but he, that doesn't work very well. We got on our campus a sitting Sun Yat Sen. It's very block-like and boring as a result, right? Um, so, um, this is a break with that very, very long tradition of verticality in sculpture, which you see even with the Brancusi. It's a little bit like the Brancusi, repeated elements. It's like you took the Brancusi, uh, very, very tall sculpture, and you brought it down. So it's kind of uh, anti-phallic in a way in its kind of engagement with sculpture. Hugging the ground, you become aware of the ground. 
aware of the, the total space. The line, it becomes a line within that space. The space is what interests you, not just what makes, uh, makes that line. It, it, he, this is how Andre puts it. He says, up to a certain point I was cutting into things. Then I realized that the thing I was cutting was the cut. Rather than cut into the material, I now use the material to cut into space. So that's what I think he's doing here. And, and this is the point in his career where he's giving up the whole idea of carving. So simplicity, you know, when you simplify beyond a certain point, then complexity comes back again, the complexity of the whole space that you're manipulating. When you're viewing the work, you, you have to move around and you're seeing it from different points of view. You're very much concerned with the, the, physical, the physical properties of things, that, you know, to use a kind of like a Buddhist, Zen Buddhist term, the suchness of things, things in themselves, not how we conceptualize them, but how, how the world actually is, not the mental maps we impose upon it. As well as challenging the verticality of sculpture, um, he's also challenging a lot of I other ideas about sculpture, such as that it should be made of intrinsically valuable material, such as marble or bronze. You know, this it's just brick. You could buy those bricks very cheaply. It's not that. And he's challenging the idea of kind of virtuosic skill as well. You know, uh, it didn't require years and years of training to be able to put those bricks in a row. That's not in a row. That's not what makes it interesting. They're not the sculptures have to made it, be made of elements that are joined. No. Can it be made of repeated elements? Yeah. And that seems to be part of the idea here. This is an example of um, from earlier modernist sculpture where you see a sculpture directly onto the ground with no no base so this is there are some certain kind of precedents this is, uh, famous Giacometti sculpture woman with her throat cut and there's there's even here th this kind of uh, hinged quality that you know this element could be in a slightly different positions This b became a very infamous work by, uh, by André uh, when it was bought by the Tate Gallery. It became known as uh, the Tate Bricks. Um, actually, the official name is Equivalent 8, 1966. It's part of a whole series of works equivalent series where the same as the title suggests in a way um, the same number of bricks arranged in different shapes so they're all equivalent to each other in terms of the number of bricks each of them is two layers of bricks thick but arranged in in different ways he even also did this thing called eight cuts which is like a kind of reverse version of that where the shapes are what is missing from the, 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 the layer. So I don't know, one question would come up whether there is meaning to just have one of these equivalents, to what extent you, you, know, you need to see them all to get the idea. But, um, well, he obviously felt it was okay to, to, to separate them out. Uh, it's a little bit like Monet's series paintings of haystacks or something yeah if you can see them all together that's a wonderful experience but um, mostly that's going to happen in an illustration it's not going to happen in real life so th this was a uh, uh, the result of a, 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 the, the cause of a lot of um, media discussion tabloid press discussion about you know, should the Tate be buying things like this, or you know, pe 
people started dumping rubbish on the steps of the Tate Gallery or offering to, sh to sell this and that to the Tate for you know, the same price and all this sort of thing. And of course, I, and then figurative artists were also saying, well, why is the Tate so concerned with abstract art? What about us figurative artists? So even people like David Hockney at one point was you know, part of a demonstration at the Tate Gallery. So I don't think that discussion in the media was really that productive of, of knowledge about art, actually. But anyway, it, it's one case where art uh, got so, a wider nor notorior, notoriety. Often he's just using metal, different kinds of metal in little arrangements of plates. It's really difficult to get much sense of them uh, what the aesthetic content of it might be when you're just looking at an illustration because that's as he himself says with his remark about photography as a kind of pornography of art he's saying it, you're, you're so distanced from the, the actual experience of viewing that what what can you possibly get so to evaluate it you have to be there you you're allowed to walk over it these metal uh, ones you can interact in a way you, you normally never get to interact with, with sculpture. It's site specific, but the site that it is most often found in is this kind of very simple white cube space. Minimalism seems kind of happy with the white cube space. It doesn't need a, a more kind of um, characterful space but nevertheless it wants to draw your attention to that space. Whereas this would be one of the crucial distinctions between minimalist art and a kind of abstract sculpture of that time. Uh, abstract sculpture or painting. For that kind of art, the white cube is a kind of like a neutral non-space background that you don't really pay attention to. It's there to kind of provide a kind of empty frame for you to view the art in. It's sort of a neutral, none thing. <laughs> well, I'm just showing you different examples to see the subtle differences from one, uh, one piece to, to another. So, 806 Munchen Glant Black Square or 64 pieces of copper, lead piece, uh, stone field sculpture. This is a little bit different, 1977. Um, this is a permanent installation. Maybe it makes us think of, uh, of Zen gardens, um, the, their arrangement of stones. Very, yeah, quite interested in Japanese things. In, again, in this letter he sent me, he said, um, through an early interest in poetry, I became familiar with haiku in translation. After I stopped carving, I discovered the texts of Lao Tzu, and I was reassured by them. So there's no, you know, there's no content, there's no meaning in the normal sense. Again, quoting from the, this letter, he says, although art can be used to communicate, I do not, do not believe that art is a form of communication. The experience of certain works of art does not convey a message to me, but induces a change of state. If people have messages for me, I would much prefer that they gave them to me directly, you know. My works do not occur in my mind. It is necessary for me to realize them in the material world in order to know them. The greatest clarity of mind I know occurs 
when I surrender myself to the physical exertion necessary to realize the work. And actually the whole letter is written in capital letters. It's kind of uh, a little bit like the kind of block-like structure of his sculptures as well. Yeah, I think of something like the Ryoanji Garden in Kyoto, when you look at something like this. Oh, there are a few works where he uses uh, sort of chance methods. Mostly he's not that interested in, in chance. He's more interested in, in control. You know, he says, actually in that letter also, he says, you know, there are so few things in life you can control. You, you might as well sort of focus on finding out what they are. So this is Spill, Scatter piece of 1966. And Copper Ribbon, 1969. Also, there's some kind of element of, um, you know, I think a random coming from the properties of the material, how it chooses to, to display itself, I think. Sorry that so many of them are black and white photos, but in a way we just have the documentation we have of, 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 of work sometimes. And I've kind of gone with the poor quality images, perhaps because I'm trying to go along with his way of thinking that you can't, the images are not going to ca capture the reality, you know, so let's kind of just accept that. And, uh, not pretend that we're, we're actually there. Donald Judd. He wrote actually a kind of interesting essay called Specific Objects in 1965, which is one of the kind of manifestos of minimalism. Um, he was, to begin with in the 1960s, he was probably more well known as a, an art critic than as an artist and his art criticism is is like his art it's very matter-of-fact descriptions he doesn't talk about meaning he talks about the physical properties of the artworks that he's reviewing so just showing you some of these sort of very beginning works he, he produces everything is untitled uh, some of the early ones, it almost starts with painting becoming objects. Already here, it's an object, though. So this is Untitled 63, Untitled 66. This is be a sort of typical minimalist work by him. This is in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So often he's using this strategy of um, modularity and repetition. Well, you could say that Andre did the same thing. Something different between the two of them is that uh, Andre, you're, he's very concerned with the the actual properties of particular metals or woods, the material in in itself. But with Judd's work, often there is color as an important factor. Color, um, color is often not doesn't feel as if it's added on the surface of something. Though it feels like well, as if it's a property of the objects them, themselves. So, for example, you'll use plexiglass and it's colored plexiglass. So, so, so color is in the actual object. It's sort of it's a property of the object. It doesn't feel like you're looking at a surface separate from the what's behind it. There never seems to be anything hidden in his works. There isn't a sense of um, here is the surface and then there's something behind that. I can remember the first time I remember the first time I, I tapped a Henry Moore sculpture and heard the sound of the, the, the hollowness inside. Of course I knew that it wasn't a solid lump of, of bronze. That would be how would you make it and it would be so heavy and so expensive and any, anyway I knew it was hollow but I remember the first time hearing the, the hollowness 
and I, that, I remember feeling it's like a oh there's something a bit sort of fake about this that it's what it's claiming to be is not what it actually is it claims to have a massive sense of mass or weight but it doesn't actually there's a kind of illusionism involved even though it's an abstract sculpture it's not an illusionistic sculpture in the normal sense but Jard I think is trying to sort of get away from that the idea that something what you see is is what is there you, you, there's nothing sort of hidden away um, everything is kind of revealed so he tends not to have kind of enclosed volumes where so there's empty space inside if there's empty space it's usually opened like a, a box without a lid, something like that. No illusions of mass that isn't there. Surfaces emphasize open forms rather than closed forms. Same here, you can see inside the whole thing. Very often his forms have, have a kind of glossiness to them they're not tactile or you don't have see the accidental um, qualities of individual pieces of wood like you do with Andre. You don't have any sense of how it was made either. You're not, he's not trying to drag your attention to how this was produced. It's almost like a miraculous thing. It just is there. It's a miraculous birth, you know, no making is is kind of referenced very simple symmetrical forms it's such a okay it's made of parts but the parts are so identical and the way they put together is so simple that you you don't think about composition or anything like that that's such that's such an easy th matter to to get sorted out you don't waste time your time thinking about that so it seems very, very simple, but then as you engage with it visually, it turns out to be not quite so simple. Because it's ge simple geometric forms, um, you maybe become more aware of how it isn't so, so easy to, 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 to take it in as you're moving around. If it was a more complex form, maybe that would be more hidden from your attention. Uh, this is a kind of example of uh, abstract modern sculpture of that time, of a kind of formalistic type. This is an Anthony Carroll sculpture that's actually in the Tate Gallery in London, early one morning, 1962. So here I think you do have a sense of form balanced against forms. Uh, you have a composition, a whole that is made of parts. So you, you're concerned with the kind of weight and balance of visual forms against each other. It's very open, like the uh, Judd work, but still um, composition still comes in. It's, uh, it's got color unifying it like the Judd work, but s still somehow it, it functions in a different way, I think. So back to Judd. Again, this is untitled, untitled 1968. He, he has a lot of works which are like this, using shiny surfaces, burnished you know, metal, uh, and plexiglass. See how the plexiglass, is, you're, you're getting light kind of spilling around. It's the same kind of simple arrangement of identical parts but as in the 1966 blue work we were looking at but here they're arranged vertically up a wall there's a lot of these kind of you could call it a kind of relief structure he, he produces this a lot so he, he uh, orders up his works from light engineering workshops you know down the phone a kind of it's a kind of sort of industrial look about it, kind of not made by hand look about it. Colour is really quite important in his work, let's see. 
another example. See how colour is often the thing that's varied from work to work. This is untitled 1970. And he's careful, he doesn't choose colours off a colour wheel like a painter might, because in a colour wheel the primaries are dominant. He chooses colours from a, a sort of catalogue of colours uh, where primaries are less kind of dominated you know, from sample catalogues. Well, this is another way he puts together the part. Again, they're open, open forms. Nothing is sort of hidden away, really. Box-like shapes, but but always you you can see into it. Vis your vision is never vision is able to see everything about the work. There's nothing that is hidden to vision. A bit like Frank Stella, you can see everything. There's no nothing hidden. Some of them, especially later on, start to get really rather large. This is really, really rather large one. It's a wooden work without colour. Um, it was in the Saatchi collection for a long time. I don't know, he, he deaccessions work, so I don't know where it is now. Maybe he still has it. Uh, so uh, I actually I don't have the photos to show you, but th the last sort of major thing he did was to uh, create a kind of big setting of his work in Marfa in Texas. You know, as a big sort of um, the Chianti foundation that uh, displays large, large selection of his work there, all in one place. So it's taken on a sort of site specificity like the whole town is basically kind of that's the main thing happening in the town is is his art maybe we stop there um, instead of looking at the work of Robert Morris so yeah, next year we can next week we can go on to look at uh, other aspects of minimalism. If I have time, I will we'll talk a little bit about um, environmental art as well. That's probably the next thing we want to move move on to look at.